Greetings, I'm Barrent and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. Today we're going to be starting our playthrough of Aetherfields by Awakened Realms. I'm super excited to get this game to you. I'm a huge fan of Awakened Realms and this is their next game that I'm excited to bring to the table. Now of course I will tell you this game has been on my table far longer than any game I've ever had and not actually been played. I know I haven't had a chance to play this one mainly because for those that don't know about the time I received this in the mail I actually went down with the coronavirus and I was out for over a week. That disease was able to keep me down for over a week. Now luckily Lucky for me, I did have a pretty mild case of it, so I really just had a lot of issues with fatigue and headaches and just overall yuckiness. But I'm back up and running and I feel good enough to start doing some playthroughs and this is the game I'm going to start doing. We're going to be doing Ether Fields. I'm excited to bring this to you. Now, of course, we're going to do our prelude first and then if we continue on, we're going to be starting into the actual campaign. So I want to go ahead and show you how this game is all set up and then we're going to start diving right in to beginning the prelude. To begin our playthrough, we're going to go ahead and select our characters. Now for the prelude, I'm only going to use the one character, which is going to be the free spirit. And I might continue using this one into the actual campaign, but we might add some characters as well just to see how other ones play as and during the game. I'm excited to try this one out though because I think the character looks so cool. And here's the miniature. Now I have the sun drop pledge, so I didn't actually put any paint on these. They came just like this. But when we move into the actual game, I might paint up some of these a little bit, just adding some color to these, just to the, at least the heroes. Maybe some of the monsters as well. We'll see how that goes. Now this is our play board right here and there's a lot of things going on there's a cool picture right in the middle now over here this white circle this is where our ether is and that's gonna be used kind of like experience points in this game and or it can be used for other things as well but it also helps you like kind of manipulate your build your deck up a little bit and getting new powers and things like that but it can also be used for other things as well and we'll see how that works this is where we're gonna put our damage that we take we're gonna put those on this side of the board also there's three other things here one we have our influence deck which is right here and our deck is consists of 22 different cards and these cards are all going to be ranging from having different colors up in the corner. Now these are all the different intent that we can use and spend to allow our character to do things inside the world and these three different types there's awareness, cunning, and there's also Wrath. These are all used for different things inside the game. We'll see how that's all played. Now there's different values inside these and that's how much we're going to be able to use to spend when we play these cards. Of course, down at the bottom, you can also use cards for some of the other powers they have. For example, Secret Door, we could use it for this if we want to and not spend the, and not use it for what we have up here. There are also some cards that are going to be able to use as progress, which is going to be pretty cool. For example, here's one right here. And the way these work is our influence deck is here our discards over here and then down here there's active progress cards and you can only have up to four active progress cards. There may be a way to unlock more of those as we play through the game, I don't know, but at the beginning of the game you're only allowed four and that's these type of cards right here because it does say um, progress right up here. I can place this card for four cunning. If I decide to pay for cunning, I can place this down in my active area here and then that means that this power I have is now a, able to be used during the game. And of course, if I meet or beat, if something happens during that, I might have to discard this card. I may have to seal the card, which means I have to flip it upside down and not be able to use what's on the card until I can unseal it or other, or I might just have to flip it over and then I wouldn't be able to use part of what the card is. But we're going to take our entire deck and we're going to give it a good old little truffle shuffle here and we're going to go ahead and place it back down over here on the influence deck side. And that's going to be our character all set to go. Now that we have our character, we're going to move to going ahead and getting the board set up. A lot of the board is not going to get set up entirely the way you would for a campaign because, of course, this is the prelude. And it's just kind of teaching you the game. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take all 12 of our turn cards and place them down here in the discard area. I know it sounds weird. We're going to put them in the discard area. And then when we go to our prelude, it'll probably tell us how many turn cards we're going to have in order to complete it. And at that point, we'll add them to this area right here, which is where we're going to put the turn cards that equal the amount of turns we have. Now over in this corner of the board, we're going to place two different starting decks as well. We have our Fate deck right here. I'm just going to give that a little shuffle here. Now I don't know what any of these cards are. It's going to be really cool to see what these are. And we also got our Flaw deck here. I'm going to mix that one up a little bit. And we're going to place those right here. If the game ever tells us to draw one, they are right there and ready to use. 
There are a lot of other elements on this board that we would normally set up during the campaign, but for the prelude, we're not actually going to be setting this up. I've done what it told me to in the book, and that's get the turn cards ready, the flaw deck, and our fate deck as well, and of course getting our character set up. The only few things we have left is we do have to make our dice available for us to be able to roll during the game, and then we're also going to have to get all the different tokens and elements that we have set off to the side. For example, we have our beads that we're going to use, and we also have some of the other tokens as well that we we might use during this playthrough. The only thing left to do is to go ahead and give everybody their basic action card, which teaches them about all the different things they can do with the elements that are found on their cards. For example, we can use one of our cunning to move one space, or for every X we use. Assault, you assault actions have basic range of one, and your contract actions have a basic range of one as well. Effort, I can lose X hours to move X spaces once per turn. Or I can peek at a card, discard one card to take a five second peek at one secret card tile from the current dream with influence item flaw fate slumber back. Hmm, interesting. And on the back of it, it does tell you a little bit about what some of the other things are going to be found on the game. For example, I can gain a shining gem. I can discard three influence cards from your hand to gain a gem. I can use a gem to re-roll any roll. I can remove morphings. I can discard one key or ether to discard one morphing if the entity is in range one. Boosting your intent. If I roll an X on the luck die, I can discard one ether or seal three cards or suffer one damage. All right. And then all the wise, there's a dreamer's death. Resolve this death wisdom card if you actually die. Let's hope that doesn't happen. We're going to most likely just keep it on this side, which is going to tell me how to do all the different action air things based on our card colors. But we might be doing some of the stuff on the back. We'll see how it goes. So there we go. Our characters have all set up, and I think we're ready to start. I hope you're as excited as I am to go ahead and start either fields. This is going to be fantastic. We get to enter the world of dreams and see what they transpire. Hopefully not into evil, twisted night. Nightmares. Hopefully they stay happy with roses and pandas and things like that. All right, we're going to go ahead now and move into the playthrough. And if you're excited to see what happens to our free spirit, then I need you to meet me at the co-op shop. Now to start our intro for the campaign, it tells us to go ahead and take card I-01X, and it says, Gate to the First Dream, before it started. What is this strange world? Hint, it will be easy, simple and short. No puzzles, no challenges, just a quick basic training and a bit of story. We have district dash, enter dash, setup. Take all I-01 secret cards and tiles. Must be intro, I'm guessing, is what the I stands for. Reveal the setup tile. You don't have any masks or items yet. We're gonna have 12 for our turn deck and we're gonna read introduction in the secret book, 450. So there we go, we have our first tile. That's pretty awesome. And on the back here, it kind of shows some neat art, kind of clouded. It says, goal, learn the basics of the game with a little winky smiley face. <laughs> That's pretty good. Special rules. If any dreamer dies in this dream, resolve S922, or if you're out of turns, go to S425. So we're going to go ahead and place that right down here on the board that shows us kind of what we're supposed to be doing. We're going to move up to the dreamscape portion of the board and go ahead and grab our zero, I-01 setup card, which is what it told us to do. And we're going to turn it over and take a look. Now, it tells us to place it on A2, but let's quick look at this card. There's a lot of different things going on here, and hopefully our introduction text will tell us a little bit about this. It says, hurry, hurry, something wicked this way comes. All right. So here's, for example, we could use one of our awareness uh, power or, uh, cards to go ahead and gain a shining gem if we want. We also can right here, we can go ahead and use three of our cunning to go ahead and take advantage of this, which then we would block this. We can only do it once and we have to do it for 
each character out here. So we have we only have one character, so we only have to spend three. Now, if we had two, we'd have to spend six, but you can do them in increments of three. So, for example, say my character had three, but my uh, friend's character did not. I could spend the three and place a token there to signify that we have met at least one of the three requirements for our two characters, but then he'll come by maybe and put the other three on there later. Here are those different tokens. So if I went to go ahead and did this, I could place mine here, and then I would know that we've done it. We've su sufficed one of the character's requirements of three. Now there are only four of these, and this is a finite resource. There are four of each of the three different types of resources. So if, say you had two out here, another one over here for some reason, and you had one here, and you wanted to put one over here, you would have to actually remove one from somewhere to place it up there, since these are finite. Now, of course, they're not going to be all over the same board. They're probably going to be scattered throughout this entire thing as we actually play through the game and doing different dreams. But for this tutorial and intro quest, we have to just only suffice it by three because we are only playing with one character. So these really are not going to be needed, but if I start using more than one character, these are going to become important, and the amount we have actually matters. Continuing on, we also have up here, we have to spend six, check this out, we have to spend six awareness, that's a lot of awareness, to go ahead and be able to do that. We can check the green altar. Now we can also assault down here with six again. We can check the red altar. Now, of course, this means that I can only do it once, but this one I could do multiple times because there isn't a block item right here or block symbol. Now this also is a little bit different. I want to talk about this. This means I have to use six awareness, but this means I have to do an assault action, which I can do at a range of one. So I could do it from over here at a range of one if I want, but I can't do this because this is not a contract contact action. It's just spending six of the different awareness that we have. So that's a little bit different. And so we have to be aware of that as we play. But I'm again gonna put it out here on A2 according to our setup instructions from our card here. And now we're gonna go ahead and read our introduction, S450. Abyss, a dark, cold rift. We crawl out from it. We're not sure, we don't remember. Where are we? We knew that a moment ago. Now, all is gone. Our mission is to go where? Maybe here, wherever we are. And more importantly, who are we? Something went wrong, or rather terrible. The memory disappears like smoke blown away by a gale, like a vision of a dream just after waking up. We have equipment with us, but for what? Everything works differently here, breaks down, turns into scraps, the moment's notice. If we lose sight of something for a while, it changes immediately. We hear birds. We smell the wet earth like after the rain. Petricor, you recall the curious name of this scent. We remember we wandered through a maze of forest paths, but we're still in the woods, probably for a very long time. Dirty, torn clothes, sore muscles, hunger, and fear. Something wanted to catch us. We barely escaped. We have to get to, to some gate. Fog rises from the steaming earth. Golden rays of the setting sun shine behind the trees. It's getting cold. Finally, we reach a lay in front of a rock wall with massive gates. The gates are closed. There are three locks, each with a symbol identical to the pedestals next to it. A leaf, a wave, a padlock. A small tree grows on the first pedestal. A large padlock is attached to the second one. On the third, a stone ewer from which water flows. It seems too simple, but well, maybe some things might be actually simple. Maybe the beginnings are always the simplest. Let's practice the basics then. This is the start of a dream. Place your dreamers in any of the spaces where there is a water-looking cyclone. There are two of these spaces, so you may choose freely. There won't be much going on for now, and the turn cards will be used only to count turns, which always starts with a draw step. There isn't anything in this dream that uses movement or performs morphing, basic, special effects. The dreamscape phase will be empty. Let's look around. 
You see three pedestals. On each one, you'll practice different actions. The green one is a simple action that will cost you six awareness. The yellow is an action for three cunning, but you have to pay it as many times as the number of dreamers. And the red is an assault action with the cost of six. The assault action might be performed in assault range. The base range is one, which means an adjacent space. Additionally, the actions on the yellow and red pedestals have a block icon, which means that they are one use only. When performed, place a block token on them to mark that they are no longer available. Look again at the action in the lower left corner of tile A2. Gain one shining gem for, each aware, for one awareness. There aren't any limits to how many times you can perform it. Treat yourself to all those shining gems. Discard a card with one or more intent to gain one gem. Now, of course, that's an awareness intent. Remember that the intent surplus is lost. What are shining gems for? You may use them to reroll any die. For now, they aren't that useful, but the time will come. In the lower right corner, there is a free action with a cost of zero. You only have to be in this space to use it. Also remember that in order to use any map action, you have to be in its space. Contact assault actions accepted. There is a wall. Note that you can't move through the wall or measure range through it. It's an impassable barrier. Now the first turn begins. Draw four cards and do something. Now, a lot of what the tutorial talked about, I actually already explained, which was actually pretty cool that it actually goes through each of those things on its own and teaches you how to do this step by step. It's pretty cool. Now, of course, we can start in one of these two places. I think I'm going to go ahead and start up there first. Maybe we can clear this first one and then just kind of move around the board and do the rest of them. All right, that's where we're going to start right there. Now, let's go ahead and draw our cards. Before we draw our cards, I do want to mention that I've taken all of the eye secret cards and tiles and placed them all up here so they're all set for us to grab if we need them. The other thing we should do before we draw our cards is get our turn deck set up. Now I've gone ahead and checked. We have 12 here, I believe. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So we're going to be using all of these. So I'm going to go ahead and flip these like this. Yes, you do get to know what's going on during the turn, but you're only allowed to look at the top one in front of you. I can't just kind of sneak and peek at the next thing. And the symbols on these cards are different types of suits. They're not going to be used unless mentioned in the actual game. And for our prelude or intro quest, it doesn't really talk about these yet maybe they'll come into play. But for now, all we have to know is that this is going to be a turn deck that's going to be counting down how many turns we have before the game is over. And like the intro said, it's really not going to play too much of a part because none of this is going to play effect. It's just going to keep track of our turns. And like the intro said, we're going to go ahead and draw four cards. One, two, three, four. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at what we have found. We have found hurry, hurry. Quick, don't fall behind. Now, of course, we can use this for two cunning or one wrath, or we could go ahead and seal this card and discard any active item to restore one chosen item. Now, sealed cards are, I don't know how hard they are to get back, but that means that this card will no longer be in your deck until you unseal it. It doesn't even go to your discard pile. It goes actually un below your discard pile in the sealed area. We also have flashback, which we're going to gain one, we could spend for one awareness, or we could place one spirit token on your dreamer board. Or seal this card to draw one plus one uh, of these type of card plus one awareness abilities or uh, a resource top cards from your discard pile. I'm, I have to not exactly sure how that exactly works. We also have so many possibilities. Again, maybe the intro will teach us a little bit about that. So many possibilities. I can do anything. This is going to give us any one of those icons. And then we have inner light. Hope can be as bright as the sun. Place a light token in any space. It is active until the end of this turn. Or seal this card to discard one morphing. So that would be something we might want to do if we need to. So here's our four cards. Now that's always going to be the beginning of our turn is to be drawing four cards. And now we're going to go ahead and spend these cards to go ahead and perform our actions. Now the first thing we're going to do is try to go ahead and appease this altar. We need to spend three cunning. Now I'm going to go ahead and spend my, was it hurry, hurry card, which means I'm going to gain two. Now I could also spend this one as well, which is probably what I'm going to do. I could go ahead and spend that. I get three and we have completed this. Now we could choose, if we wanted to, to just do the two and we could choose to roll our luck die. Now on our luck die, there's many different things. There's two blanks. 
these mean that they are getting no extra ones. The, this is an, a bad failure. You don't want that. You're going to gain like damage or seal cards or things. Now, these right here, these are the pips that you want. They're going to add whatever resource you wanted to. Now, I'm not going to use this die this turn, but it is something we have the ability to do if we want to. I'm going to go ahead instead and spend one, two, three of our cunning to go ahead and check out S159. Just to make sure, did you multiply the cost by the number of dreamers? The character icon means that the cost must be paid as many times as the number of dreamers perform this action. Just making sure as those are your beginnings. If you're playing alone, the cost is three times one, so it's still three, nothing changes. If there are two of you, the cost is doubled and now six. If three, the cost is nine and so on and so forth. Additionally, as this is a gradual action, you may pay the cost in steps. You don't have to pay it all at once. Of course, if you have enough intent, you may do it and use this action. But if you don't have that much, but at least for one basic cost, in this case it's three, you may pay it and place one of these cunning intent markers next to this action. It means it's paid once. When you or another dreamer pay the rest, then you can use this action. If you didn't make any mistakes and paid the right cost, place one token on the dream gate. That's a universal marker, I believe. Also, it says, after using this action, discard all of the cunning intent markers that lie next to this action. If not for the block icon, you would be able to pay and use this action again and again another for another one of those universal markers, but you can't. The block icon before the cost means that you have to mark it with a block token after using it for the first time. When there's a block token on an action, you can't use it anymore until the end of this dream. So we're going to go ahead and place a block icon right there, and we're going to go ahead and gain one of these universal tokens and place it on our character card. Wow, I'm actually pretty impressed at how well they teach us how to play this game. We're going to go ahead and place the universal marker right here on that tile. Then we're going to discard our two cards. And since we don't have any more cunning on our cards to play, I'm going to go ahead and end our first turn. With the dreamers phase complete, we move into the dreamscape phase, which is where entities and dream event steps would take place. There aren't any of these going on in this intro like it mentioned. So the only thing we have left to do is discard the turn step. And that's going to mean we're just going to go ahead, discard this turn card, and go to the next turn. Now notice, of course, there's different things happening on the cards, but since this is the intro and it tells us not to worry about any of that, it's just going to teaching us that these are the amount of turns we have to complete this mission. Moving into our dreamers phase, we're going to go ahead and draw our cards. Now, the most you can ever have in your hand is six. Of course, unless an item or a part of the game has told you otherwise. And since we're only doing the intro, we only are able to get six. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and draw. The max you can draw is four at any one time. Unless, of course, that puts you over your hand limit, then you can't draw that. So if we had four cards in our hand, we'd only be able to draw a maximum of two. Since we only have two, we can draw four, which will bring us up to our hand size of six. So we're going to want to use some of these cards. We have found Secret Door. So we use it for two, of course, but we can also place one Spirit Token on my Dreamer board. Additionally, if all players agree, you may end this Dream Slumber. Each Dreamer suffers one damage instead of the other Dream Slumber penalties. All right, well, I don't think we're gonna do that because this is the intro. We have another one of our so many possibilities. We have a card called Slap. Let me fix your face. <laughs> Any one Dreamer may re-roll their roll, so I can go ahead and do that if I wanted to. Or, of course, I can always use them for the top things. Thoughtful Moment. That's a pretty cool looking card. I have a sort. I have to sort out a few things. Seal this card to block any one step on the current turn. All right. Well, again, since it's the intro, we're probably going to be using these for actually more of the costs up here than we are for the down here things. But who knows? As we go on, we might find a use for some of those other bottom parts of these cards. I'm now going to move into the Dreamer phase where I'm going to go ahead and use, of course, our first card. So many possibilities to use it as a cunning resource to go ahead and move. I'm going to move over to here, and I think you see where this is going. I've got a whole ton of this awareness, and we're going to play a lot of it here. I'm going to go ahead and just spill everything I have here. I'm going to go ahead and spend one, two, three, four, five, six of my awareness to go ahead and appease this. Now, like I mentioned before, this is not a contact action, so I can't do it from a space away. I actually have to be in the square because I'm just spending the resources. Since we spent our six, we're going to go ahead and check the green altar S332. 
you may try to gain one universal marker here. It's required to open the gate. And you'll learn how to use the luck die and how to influence its results. So let's begin. Roll the luck die. X or dash equals nothing. Nothing? Does it mean that you paid for the action, but you didn't gain anything? Unfortunately, that's how it is. But if you have any shining gems, you may discard one of them to re-roll the die. And you may do it as many times as you want, if you have that many gems, of course. If you don't have any, too bad. It's better to gain some bef and shining gems before coming back here to check the green altar action and spend six awareness again to use it. One, two, three, it works. Place one universal token on the dream gate tile, then block this action. See, there, it wasn't a block icon here, but sometimes it's hidden inside the action. Many additional effects may take effect inside the script. So again, this game is teaching us right along as we play, and sadly, I'm actually teaching you twice, I guess, apparently. I've already taught you about the die, but here we go. We're going to roll it again. Now, I did get two pips, so we were successful, even though I already paid the entire thing. We're going to go ahead and place our marker right there to show that it's blocked. We're going to take our universal token and go ahead and place it on our tile. We're going to go ahead and remove this, but we are going to move into another action. I'm going to go ahead and play this to go ahead and move two squares down here. Now, something I do want to talk about are the actions that you can take. During the game, you're going to be doing rounds. Each character is going to be performing an action during the round, and then somebody else will be going. Now, you can only perform one map action, or you can only perform one dream gate tile action, dream secret card action, or entity tile interaction during your turn before you have to have somebody else go ahead and do something. Now, it's kind of similar to the way Nemesis works. You do two actions and you pass, or you, and then the next person gets to do two actions, and you keep on going until, of course, you get to a point where everybody passes and we go into the end of turn, which then would be the dreamscape phase. Now, since I'm playing solo, I can kind of do as many actions as I want to as I have cards and the ability to do because there aren't any other people playing at this point to make me stop. So, for example, if I did this map, action over here, I move two over here, I could go ahead and interact with this map action again in my same turn because it's a different round. It'll be a lot more easy to explain how this works with multiple characters and thinking more now, I probably should have used multiple characters, especially since they have these actions that involve having multiple characters carry out an action. But that's beyond the point. We're going solo right here and that's the way it's going to be. But I do want you to know that you can do more than one thing on a map tile, but you have to do them in rounds. And since we're playing by ourselves, we can kind of take as many rounds as we want before we get to the point where we're passing. And we are going to pass right here because, of course, I am out of cards, so I can't actually do anything else. That means I'm going to go ahead and discard all my cards and move into the dreamscape phase, which means all we're going to do during this dreamscape is go ahead and go to the next turn card. Since I have no cards, I get to go ahead and draw four. We're going to see what we have got. We were able to find Pathfinder. I can get through, I suppose, and this says you may move diagonally during the current move action, then roll the luck die. If I get an X, I have to flip this card. Now, this is a progress card. I believe this is the one I actually explained when I showed it off. I can place this card if I want to spend four cunning. Let's see if we have four cunning. We have one right here, shining. Ooh, look a penny. If I'm in this area, I can, I can gain one shining gem. Well, I'm actually in that area. I might actually use it for that. Let's see here. Two more. And I can progress this card, too. I can play it for four. Spirit. That's the spirit. Whenever you seal any cards, you may place one spirit token in your dreamer board for each of these sealed cards. So if you're having to seal cards, at least you're able to get something out of it. All right. We also have so many possibilities. And we're back to here. So we actually got a lot of this. One, two, three, four. I actually got all four if I wanted to actually place one of these cards in our progress. I might actually do that. I was actually thinking about getting the Shining Gem, but being able to move diagonal might be pretty good. So we're going to go ahead and spend four of these. One, two, three, four of our awareness to go ahead and play this under our active progress cards. So now I can move diagonally during my current action, then roll a luck die. And if I get an X, I'm going to have to flip this card. That was kind of a weird turn. That's the end. We're going to move into our next Dreamscape turn, and that's going to be just flipping the card. Moving into our next round, I'm going to draw four cards. One, two, three, four. And let's see what we have found. There is four. We have found, oh, hurry, hurry. We have found effort. I'll do it no matter what. 
I can gain three by spending one. All right, that might not be bad. I've got progress here. I can place this card for six awareness and one damage. Optimization, sometimes less is more. Dream world map only. Discard this card when resolving a delta phase to choose two options instead of one. I think we're gonna be doing that because I don't even know what half those words are. <laughs> we have hesitation. Someone has to take the risk if we want to get out of this alive. Steal this card to gain three awareness, cunning, or wrath. Oh, that might be a good way to do this. We got another one. So we've got a total of one. I could spend this to gain three, and then I could flip this for another three, or steal it, I mean, to give myself six, which would be enough to do our assault action. Let's go to the board and figure it out. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and use this card. I'm going to go ahead and gain two awareness for this card and I can spend one to gain one shining gem and I'm going to go ahead and place this down next to our character. We can use this to re-roll a die, that luck die, which I haven't had to roll yet, which means I must be pretty lucky because I don't have to roll it. We're going to go ahead and play that. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and play hurry hurry for one wrath. And the wrath we're going to use is going to be for our effort card here to allow us to gain three wrath. Now, you can only play cards on your turn unless they have this symbol. Then you could play them also during the dreamscape or other dreamers phases as well. But we're going to use it, of course, on ours to gain three there. And the last thing I'm going to do is I am going to go ahead and seal this card to gain three more wrath, which means we're going to flip this card over and place it down next to our board. I'm not going to get that back unless the game tells me I'm allowed to unseal a card. But that does give us six wrath, which is enough to deal with this assault action. Now notice I'm not in the same square, and that's because it's an assault action that can be done at least one square away. We're going to go read S234. If you're here, it means that you tried assault, a rather violent solution to problems. Remember that an assault action and a contract action can be used from a distance. The basic range of this action is stated on your basic action card. It is one, but many cards may increase it. And don't forget the effect of your action. Place one universal marker on the dream gate tile and don't forget to block this action with a block token too as there is a block icon. It means this action is a one use only. So we're going to place our block token right here, put our universal marker on our card, and that's going to be the end of our turn. We're going to go ahead and discard and seal our cards. So we're going to discard these three, and I'm going to seal this card by placing it right down there. It does not go in our discard pile, and I'm not going to get it back unless the game tells me to unseal any of my cards. We're going to go continue on by moving into our next turn. We're going to start by drawing four cards, one, two, three, four, and see what we get. We have got... One with the shadows. I'm able to use it for two cunning. It also says they won't find me here. And it only works during darkness spaces. When you suffer any damage from the entity effect, roll the luck die. If I get any of these, I can prevent one for each one card down here during my active progress cards that have that symbol. And then I can go ahead and remove that damage or prevent it. I have more effort. All right. We have a slap. Any dreamer may reroll their die. And we have a World Shaper. That card looks absolutely stunning. It says, let's change this place. Place your personal token in any space of the dreamscape. Until the end of this turn, treat this token as one of the following icons below. Wow, I could turn myself into anything I want, a personal token, anything I want. Wow, that's amazing. All right, so we're going to go ahead and take our four cards and decide what we want to do. Now, I've got a lot of different things I can do, but I think the first thing we're going to do is we're going to interact with this thing a couple times. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of both of these cards, doing two different actions here to gain two more shining gems, and I think I'm going to do it again with this card. So that's going to be three of our awareness cards to gain three more gems. That's four gems. That should be pretty good. Now we're going to use our last card here, with one with the shadows, to move over to this area, and I can try to open the door because it costs me absolutely nothing. S823. But of course, first I want my shining gems. I got three of them. Oh my gosh, my guy's loaded with shining gems. Pretty excited about that. Check how many universal tokens are on the Dreamgate tile. If there are three of them, discard them, reveal the tile Z, and resolve S 
173. If not, the door won't budge. Hurry! Try to perform more actions from A2 tile. There must be a way to open this door. Lucky for us, we have three of these universal tokens. Since we have three universal tokens, we get to go ahead and check out tile card I01Z. It goes right A3. A3. All right, yep, it's going to go right up here. Okay, so we got a whole bunch of new things here. For one, I can go ahead and open and close a door. I can also enter a secret tunnel. I can use some leverage. I can, if there are no entity in range one, you may use two of these for every one character. It is some kind of a game. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? That's hilarious. Ether Field is right down there. All right. It also says for 10, I can open or close the door. Oh my gosh, 10. Well, I don't think that's going to happen. All right, we're going to put these here. Now, another thing I want to mention since our tiles have become bigger is these spiky lines here are actually considered our walls in this game. So I cannot move across these over to these squares without going around. Now, of course, we do have an open door now, which is pretty cool. So we have our new tile, and I have to read our next passage. The gate is open. What hides inside? Do you see the darkness icon at the center? It means that the whole tile, all four spaces, is in darkness. If the icon were smaller and between two spaces, it would mean that there are only two spaces are in darkness. If there were even the smaller and only in one space, then that space would have only one darkness. Now, of course, there are other icons as well, and similar icons work the similar way. But then something happens. Before you manage to take a step in, something emerges from the forest. Resolve S257. I'm sure this is not going to go very well for us. Reveal tile Y and spawn one human shapeshifter. Spawn. It means place one miniature in a space with the little pink symbol. There is only one in the current dreamscape, so this is so easy. There is no flavor text this time. Treat this script as an active pause, a possibility to learn more about your enemy. Tile Y is an entity tile. Place it on the entity slot. So we're going to go ahead and take tile Y and go ahead and take a look at it. Now, of course, this is going to be something wicked. A huge human shapeshifter, all right? We're going to have to go find the miniature for that. It looks like it's got a bunch of pipe flutes. We'll see if we can find it. Now, of course, up here it shows that we have movement. I don't know why I'm going to explain all this because I'm sure the game will. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and see here. If I do an assault action of six per character, so that would just mean me. Relocate this entity to any of the spawn spaces. That's not very good. It says the simplest creature in the dream world of dreams. All right, so these are the different effects it's going to do to us. No effect. Each dreamer in range suffers one damage, or each dreamer in range two, range two seals two cards. And that's going to be based off our turn card. So actually, it's going to be pretty bad. I'm going to go ahead and place it right here, and we're going to go ahead and get the miniature. So I've gone ahead and grabbed a miniature. I'm not sure if this is the one we're supposed to use. There aren't any in there with pan flutes that look like the card. I'm just going to go ahead and put this out here. It looks pretty imposing to me. We're going to put him right there, and he's probably going to chase us down. Something Wicked has a movement value of four. I'm glad I didn't teach too much because it is going to teach us everything. It's important when you resolve a, the movement step, a yellow die icon on the current turn card and roll the entity movement die. If the result is an arrow, the entity moves one space, ignoring its movement value. If it is an arrow with a bunch of lines at the end, it moves by its movement value. In this case, it'd be four spaces. If the result is the arrow with the lines and a plus, it not only moves its current value, but then it will roll again. To remind you of the rules, entities always move toward the nearest dreamer unless otherwise stated. If there are several dreamers in the same range, you may decide which one is the target of the entity. You may use this to save your wounded companion from certain death, lure the entity to some spaces, or perform other tricks. What happens if there's no valid route toward any dreamer, or if the entity already is in a space with a dreamer? It simply won't move. Below, there are entity interactions. There is only one this time, and it is the assault action. It seems you won't practice too much contact in today. If you spend a total of six wrath multiplied by the number of dreamers, you activate the assault effect. In this case, you relocate the entity to its spawn space. 
Remember that relocate is such a better movement because it doesn't care about walls. Relocating is something like a teleport, but relocating to any spawn space won't help you much at the moment because we have seen that there's currently only one spawn space in the dreamscape. So each time you perform the assault interaction, you teleport the entity back to its spawn space. There's more. CS248. Below interactions, there are three entity effects that this entity performs in the dreamscape phase, morphing, basic, and special. As you can see, they correspond to the steps on the turn card. When dreamers finish their actions in each turn, the dreamscape phase takes effect, resolving the current turn card. Resolve all steps from the current turn card in order. Steps trigger some of the entity effects. Example, the first turn may be movement, special, morphing. And the second one may be basic, basic again, and then movement. Each turn is different from the other. This entity has an empty morphing, as it would make it too powerful otherwise. Well, that's very kind of them. Later, if a specific entity does not have some of the effects, treat them as if they do nothing when they should be resolved. The basic effect is something that is performed most often, and it's generally an effect that harms nearby dreamers. In this case, if any dreamer is in range 1 in the same or adjacent space, when resolving the basic effect of this entity, the dreamer suffers 1 damage. If you don't remember how damage works, consult the rulebook. In short, if any dreamer suffers 8th damage, they die, and it won't be anything pleasant. No, it probably won't. The special effect of this entity has an even greater range, too. Remember that it may be counted in any direction, but not diagonal. A space connected diagonally is in range 2, one space vertically and one space horizontally. The special effect seals two cards. Each affected dreamer has to move the top two cards from their influence deck to the sealed pile, which is worse than discard. Cards from discard go back to your deck rather quickly when you reshuffle, but cards from the sealed pile do not. They don't go back until the game allows you to take them back. Unseal. So, they are temporarily unavailable to you. It's not a pleasant effect, but you have to cope with it as it's one of the most common effects in this game. Both damage and sealed cards define how tired, discouraged, and wounded your dreamer is. Look at the turn card and check what the entity will do when you end your dreamer's phase. If it doesn't look good, keep a safe distance or attack to repel the monster for a moment. You have only opened a door and revealed two tiles, and so many things have changed. And that's not all because you might have overlooked something. C251. Did you notice that when the gate opened, you unearthed a new space with two new map actions? Difficult choices await you now, right? To enter and check if there's something that can help you or go back and see around the wall and check the new space outside the grotto. But what about the dangers behind you? It's still early in the game, so your opinions will be presented here as a little deviation. Run into the grotto and perform the action at the end of it. Close the door. It looks quite sturdy and should save you from the beast, but will you make it? The action is really expensive. Ten. Designers have to be mad, right? If you had two, three turns, you would manage to do it, but the creature would also be inside. Shutting yourself with it, it isn't the brightest idea. There's a similar action on the outside, and it's cheap. One! It's almost nothing! But if you close the door from the outside, how would you get inside? Maybe through a nearby secret tunnel. The situation is excavated and stupid and obvious, you might think. Maybe you're right, but... Don't you think the first dream shouldn't be too complicated? Maybe there are other options, but do what you want. The door won't close itself.
So what that book was talking about is up here, there's one that costs 10. This is the one they're talking about that would be kind of crazy to do because I would have to run over here and try to get it closed. Of course, I can go around this way and it says I can close the door from out here for only one. And it says a secret tunnel. So being the first dream, I don't think there's going to be too much trickery to this. This might be the way to go. But of course, we still have to deal with this guy. And guess what? I don't have any cards left. So that's the end of my turn. He's going to go activate anyway. So we're going to go ahead, discard our four cards, and then we're going to move into our dreamscape phase. Now, I'm kind of at the mercy of this thing. I don't have anything I can do about it. And technically, unless I had some cards that had the little lightning bolt symbol, but I don't, I've used all my cards. So we're at its mercy. So the first thing is it's do is its basic effect, which if we see down here. It says each dreamer in range one suffers one damage. Well, we're in range one, so we are going to suffer one damage. Now, the other thing we're going to do is go ahead and roll our die because that's going to be the next thing we're going to do is we're going to roll our movement die. And it is going to move its maximum movement of four towards the closest dreamer, which is me. Then it's going to go ahead and perform its special effect, which states each dreamer in range two seals two cards. So that's also going to happen as well. So we're going to go ahead first and move this guy right over to where we are. And we're going to go ahead and take one damage and place it over here. Then I have to seal two cards, which are my last two cards. I'm going to put them right here. So all these three cards are sealed. I don't have access to them. And now since I have no cards to pick, I'm going to go ahead and shuffle up my deck. We're going to just go ahead and give it a truffle shuffle here, just like that. And we're also, since we reshuffled our deck, we either have to take one damage or we have to seal three cards now from the top of our shuffled deck. I'm choosing to take one damage. Hopefully we can get away from this thing and not take any more damage. I'm going to grab four cards. One, two, three, and four. And let's see what we have. We have so many possibilities. One with the shadows. Now, if I'm in a dark space, when I suffer damage from an entity, I can go ahead and roll this dice and prevent one for every one of these, which is kind of nice. Um, then I have slap. I could actually maybe hurt this thing. And I believe, oh, I got another slap. So I could do up to six. But of course, it's only going to move it one space back. All right. We're going to have to figure out what we want to do. Now, one thing we have to do before we do our turn is when we did activate our something wicked, I actually forgot to when we were done resolving the different steps between the dreamscape, I was supposed to discard this card to see what our next turn card is supposed to be. Now, hopefully it's not as bad as that one because that was terrible. It's got a morphing ability, which is look if we look on our card is no effect. But then we've got that special effect again where he's going to go ahead and with range two, he's going to seal two cards and he's going to roll his movement die to try to get closer to us. So we want to make sure we're not within range two of him before he activates. And I do have a plan for that. What we're going to do is we are going to play this card, which is going to give us one of anything. And I'm going to choose to use Cunning. We're going to take Cunning for that one. And then we're also going to play this card as well. Take two more Cunning. So now we have a total of three Cunning, allowing us to move three squares. Now, we want to try to get up here, according to what we read. What we're going to do to do that is we are going to use one of our progress cards that we've put down there. It says you can move diagonally during the current move action, then roll the luck die. If I get an X, I flip this card. Normally, you cannot move diagonally. You can only move orthogonally around the board. I may not have mentioned that, but it is true. So with this special card, though, I am allowed to go diagonal. So I'm going to move one, two, three three right over there and then we're going to roll our luck die and see what happens to us we got a three pip so we're fine we get to keep that card without having to flip it because we did not get the x now that we've used our three cunning we're going to go ahead and use our next intent we're going to use this one to go ahead and dig into the secret book again if we use one we can open or close the door go to s083 you may close the door. Place a block token on the open door slot. Closed doors are treated as a solid wall in this dream. If you close the door, neither entity nor dreamers may move through this wall. You don't have to remember this as a new rule for the whole game. It's an example of a special rule, which applies only in this dream. Treat it as an additional special rule for this dream. And if you want to, you may open the door if it was closed, discard the block token. You may open and close the door as many times as you want, but you have to pay the action cost each time. Like it said, we are going to take our block token and place it right here on the open door. I think having a closed door is going to be fantastic. 
Now I only have one more slap card, which gives me awareness or wrath. I don't want to use either of those because awareness will open the door again. That's a bad idea. And wrath, there's really nothing to attack because it has to be within one square to actually be able to use that action, the assault action. So we're going to be done with our turn. We're going to move into our something wicked. And he's going to go ahead and activate on his card. He's going to morph, which is nothing. Then his special ability has a range of two and he cannot count through these walls. So his range would be one two. He can't reach us with his special ability, which is fantastic. So then we're going to go ahead and roll our die. So we're going to take our movement die. We're going to roll it up and see what we get. We've got that one that makes him move all of his speed, which is four. He's again going to come tearing through us, or tearing to us, I should say. One, two, three, four. He again is in our square. Wow, this guy's absolutely relentless. we got to get out of here. Now that he's done, we're going to go ahead and move into our next turn card. And again, we have a basic effect, roll the die, basic effect. Now his basic effect is going to deal one damage to dreamers in range one. So we don't want to be within range one of him yet again. We do need to discard our cards from the last turn, and we need to draw four new cards. One, two, three, and four, and see what we have found. We have gotten a so many possibilities. We've got effort. Another so many possibilities and secret door. So we've got a lot of cunning. That's going to be fantastic because we got to get out of here. Now, of course, we do get to keep our card from last turn. And now we're going to move into our turn and see what we can do. We need to get away from this something wicked. So I'm going to go ahead and use so many possibilities. We're going to use it as a cunning. And that is going to allow us to enter the secret tunnel S-179. Well, this secret tunnel seems to be... A secret tunnel! It appears it wasn't so secret after all. You may relocate your dreamer to any space of the A3 tile. Relocate isn't a standard move, but something similar to teleportation. Go on, ignore walls, and place your dreamer in any space of the interiors. So if we look at our tile, there are three places in the interiors, here, here, and here. So we can place ourselves in any one of these places. There are three possible things to do. Now, one, we already know this is open or door, that door. I don't think we're open the door. I like it just like this. Now, right down here, it says some leverage. So we could use a couple of our cunning to go ahead and try that, or we could just relocate over here and says, if there are no entity in range one, you may use two awareness. Is it some kind of game? And then look at it, it does have the Ether Fields game right down here. I think we're just going to continue on trying all the different things. I'm going to move right down here into this area, and then I'm going to play my secret door, but not for the bottom text. I'm going to go ahead and use it for the two cunning, and we're going to go ahead and check out some leverage. S30. We pull the lever. A crash can be heard from the outside. Reveal card C. A trap! If you have done it before and the trap is already revealed, read the section from if the trap card is revealed. Well, that doesn't happen. We've not actually pulled this thing before. You're looking at an overlay card. It acts as a missing additional or change piece of the dreamscape. You have to place this card on the dreamscape immediately. How? Look closely and match it with the grid and the code. It's written on the overlay card and the dreamscape examples A1, B2, etc. Remember to match it precisely, even if this means placing it askew at a strange angle. Place all miniatures and tokens which would be otherwise covered by the overlay card on top of it. Done? It should fit quite right. The card may look strange at first, but it really has to be placed at this angle. What has changed? There's a new wall that closes two spaces. Will it be useful for something? You'll discover it soon, probably. So we're going to go ahead and reveal our card C. We have found trap. We have to put this down. Okay, I see how this works. Okay, so first off, I've got to discard this. All right, we're going to put that over here, and I've got to lay this down on A2 just like this. All right, I'm going to go ahead and remove some of these tokens so that I can place this down. We're going to cover up A2 just like that so it looks pretty close to as perfect as I can get it. And there we go. I bet it fits in just like that. Wow, that's pretty cool. Okay, that's awesome. It actually fits neat. All right, I'm still going to put my lock token here. And I'm going to put my other lock token right here, or block token, sorry. And we have another spawn point up here. And check this out. There's walls all through here, and he can't go through these secret tunnels as far as I understand, at least for this mission. It doesn't say anything about being, him being able to interact with anything on the board. He just moves towards us. And right now, he can't move to us, so that's fantastic. I think we've actually cornered this guy. That's pretty sweet. 
And now that he's cornered, I'm going to continue. I'm going to go ahead and use so many possibilities again to grab a cunning, move over here, and use my last two cards for my awareness. I'm going to gain two awareness, and we're going to go ahead and deal with this right here. If there's no entity in range one, you may spend the two for each player. Now, of course, I only have one player, so our free spirit is going to go ahead and check out S326. Is it some kind of game? Just to make sure, did you meet the conditions stated above the action? There can't be any entity in range one. There isn't, because we can't draw lines through the walls, and he was over two spaces away. Anyway, it also says here that not that we suspect something, we just make sure. <laughs> Remember that you can't measure range through a wall. And if everything is all right, let's continue. We feel like small children when looking at this table. We can barely see the tabletop. And there is a pencil the size of an arm laying on a pile of crumbling papers. Behind the pile, we spot something that is probably a game. What else could it be with all those dice, notes, and tables? It must be old, as it's covered with a sticky and fluffy blanket of cobwebs and dust. We are starting a game right now? Something was chasing us. We were running. No, we were here, playing for a long time, sitting in a cozy room, slightly bent over the table. The game is so immersive, we have almost forgotten it was just a game. We look at the box again. Release date, 1937. Many wires and cogs stick out of the cardboard covering. More writing. Let's have a look. This is not an ordinary game, but a mental device that tells a story about the players who play the game. They need to find something they lost long ago. What's all this? A game about players playing the game? A device? Nonsense. It's just an old, simple game, although... Reveal tile five. You'll be fine on your own from now, right? By the way, probably some of you have already reshuffled your discard pile a few times. Did you remember to receive the penalty for this? If not, remember the reshuffle rule in the manual. Now we're gonna go ahead and take tile, well not five, it's V. I guess I've been thinking too much of Roman numerals. <laughs> All right, we're gonna go ahead and see what it is. It is... It looks like an area B3. We have a wrath action that we can go ahead and do. Now, it's not an assault action, so it has to be in the square. Loose boards. We also have one down here. What's behind the curtain? And then we have, let's check this lift. Okay, so we've got a lot of different things we can do here. It goes down on B3, which is right here. So we're slowly connecting our world. Look, it's spilling out over here. That's pretty awesome. Now I have to discard all my cards, I've used them all, and we're gonna move into the dreamscape phase. Now lucky for us, thanks to our trap, we have sealed him in here. He's not gonna do anything. The only thing he has is his basic effect. Roll the dice, basic effect. And I believe if I remember right, the rules state that he's not gonna move if he can't actually get to somebody. So he's just gonna stay right there. Now it's kind of nice that we dealt with our something wicked at least, but our turn deck is over half done. We have to get a move on and we have to figure out what to do next. We're gonna move into our turn and draw four cards and see what we get. We have gotten inner light. We've gotten progress card, or we get to at least get two of the cunning from that. We have a hurry card, cunning and wrath, and then we have our effort card. All right, that's good. We're going to grab our four cards and we're going to move on to our turn. With our action deck slowly depleting, I've got a plan. The first thing we are going to do is we are going to play our effort card. We're going to play this to allow us to move one space down to here. Now, this is going to take two wrath to complete this action, but what we're going to do is we're going to use our hurry, hurry card for one wrath and we're gonna test our luck. We're gonna roll our luck die. Let's see how that goes for us. I'm gonna roll it up. Now I need to get a one, two, or three pip on this. We got a three pip, that's awesome. So we have successfully completed. I got three plus one is four wrath to go ahead and deal with our loose boards, S181. Now remember, this could have needed more than two because I, but I only have one character I'm playing with. A loose plank, a universal symbol of hidden treasure. We can't ignore it. 
a moment of struggle and we rip it off. Underneath, inside a small hole, rests an old chest. Its lid is ajar, letting out tendrils of mist. When it thins out, we notice some curious items inside. Take five starting item cards. You just earned your first items. There are quite a few, but you'll need them. And if you don't remember how items work, check the rule book to refresh their rules. You have only three slots for active items. Use them to place the items you think will be the most useful in the upcoming situation. All dreamers may use active items whenever they want, perform their actions, effects, or discard them to the storage and to use them as intent to pay for something else. You have to place the two redundant items in storage. They are still yours, but currently unavailable at least until you perform a restore item effect in some way. After you pick your active items, move on. There is no reason to stand over the empty chest. Here on the game mat, it shows where the three active items will go. I have taken our five starting items and we're gonna go ahead and see what they are. We have, what is this? Journal. Memory is elusive, but what is written becomes eternal. So I can use this for two influence if I want, or I, awareness, sorry, awareness, or I can go ahead and use it as an item. I can spend four to allow each dreamer to may seal one card to unflip all their cards or to reshuffle their deck without penalty. Discard this item after use. Okay, that's pretty good. Put that one there. What's the next one? The Book of Birds. Each of us was a bird once. So for zero, I can go ahead, each dreamer may place one progress card from their hand for free and discard this item after use. So that's pretty good. All right, then we got a strategic plan. Let's talk before we go in. In slumbers only, each dreamer may move up to six spaces, discard this item after use. Or of course, I can use it for these symbols up here for wrath or for awareness. And then I would discard the item as well to use it for that. Next thing we have is spring perfumes, usually mesmerizing fragments. Unusual, sorry, unusual mesmerizing fragments. I can use it for two, or during a content action, you may discard this item to gain six awareness. Oh my gosh, that's really good. I might take that one too. What's this? Little helpers, tiny but effective. So I can get four from this, or I can use one and reroll any die once per roll, or discard this item to restore one item. Oh man, we've got a lot of items we have to choose from. Now I can only pick three, which means two we are not gonna be using for the rest of this adventure. I've decided not to take these two cards. One, the board's not that big, hopefully it's not gonna get much bigger, so I don't know if I'm gonna need the cunning to move, and this would be pretty cool, but it's four to activate this journal card, so I'm not gonna use that. Instead, we're gonna take our little helpers, which I could use for four, or of course I could use the reroll dice. I'm gonna use my spring perfume, which I could then, during a contact action, I may discard this to gain six. So if we were a contact action we gotta deal with, that'd be awesome. And the next one we're gonna do is our strategic plan. I could use this for either one of those and four of one, either one of those resources is probably gonna be fantastic. Now, when I said that these weren't gonna be used for the rest of the adventure, I, I'm just talking about this dream right here for our intro. After the intro is done, or even during the intro, it might tell us to try to bring some of these items back. I don't know how exactly it's gonna work, but for now, we have these items. If we use them, we do have to discard them back to our storage. Continuing our turn, I'm gonna go ahead and use our card here, Spirit, to gain two cunning which is gonna allow us to move down here. And then again, we are gonna test our luck. I'm gonna go ahead and use my inner light to grab two of our awareness. And we're then gonna go ahead and roll our luck die. And I need to get at least one pip in order to make it through here. And we got one pip, that's awesome. We've got one, two, three. So we were able to see what is behind the curtain. Reveal card A. We're gonna take card A and see what it says. Do you know who you are? Resolve S313, next time you check the lift, add plus 10 to the script number. All right, I'm gonna place that right down here, and we're gonna go look up S313. We find a door hidden behind a curtain. Its hinges woefully creak as we open it. We're now inside a dressing room, probably in a theater, as there are many costumes and masks. Wait, masks? Find card 22, 41S, <laughs> I guess that's what it is. 
you can find them in the secret cards in this huge mysterious deck which you should peek at without instructions to do so or shouldn't peek at sorry do you have them surely all of them count please make sure there are 14 of them now each dreamer may choose two of these cards don't look at the rules on the mask for now pick the mask cards looking only at the illustrations and names then each dreamer should find the corresponding mask in the box now you may read the rules on their backs these are your masks then each dreamer picks only one of the chosen masks. It will be their active mask. The second one should be placed aside, IA, for example, in the box. Dreamers will be able to put it on only when the game allows you to restore a mask. Furthermore, each dreamer keeps the mask card for their masks so they can easily mark which mask they own when saving the game. You still don't know who you are, but the masks help a little. You at least can pretend that you are someone. And if you almost know who you are or who you pretend to be, maybe the elevator will listen to you. The next time you perform the check lift action, add 10 to the number of the script. It will be a script 224 instead of 214. And so you don't forget, there's a reminder on a do you know who you are card. The book was right there as a plethora of these cards. Look at these. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. Now on the back of them are the pictures of these masks. So we have Insider. And down here it says the mask belongs to your dreamer. So we have to figure out which one we want to keep. We have Insider. We have Wisdom. We have Tough. Pain. Luck. Hate. Haste. Ghost. I feel like I'm at a hearing test, repeating back words that a person is saying to me. Fear. False, what's this one? Devotion, that one looks pretty cool. Dark, chaos, calm, and insider. Okay, so we gotta pick two for our free spirit. I think I'm gonna, I have no idea what any of these do. I'm gonna go ahead and take devotion and I'm gonna take chaos just because I think that's pretty cool. She's devoted in chaos, that's gonna be awesome. All right, we're gonna go ahead and put these back in the box. Next, it told us to go ahead and grab the two masks that go with our cards, and then we need to see what our masks do. Chaos is right here, and it's got a rule. It says, what's this? Once per turn, I can use a gem to roll the luck die. Resolve all effects of the current turn card. Oh, barf. Add one morphing. Daze an entity in range. Paralyze or stun an entity. All right, so this is going to have to deal with our entity. That's pretty cool. So what does devotion do? Devotion says... Your hand size limit is increased by two. Hmm. I think we're going to keep that one. Chaos sounds pretty cool, but I don't think we're, we've locked our guy away, so I don't think I have to worry about him. So it did say we have to put this back in the box, I believe, but I get to keep the card to show that I actually have that mask available to me. I have to, I have to go back and check to make sure that's right. Now we do get to keep devotion. I'm going to put the mask out here. Now we have those neat little stands that I can put these in, but for right now, we're just going to lay it down next to us. I'm going to put the card with it right here as well. And the reason I'm doing this is so you can at least see it. If I had it standing up, you might not be able to see it as well. So we're going to put it just like that. And then I'm going to make sure that it is okay to keep this card. Yes, according to the game, we're going to go ahead and keep our card. We just don't keep the mask out here. I'm going to have discarded our cards. We're going to move into the dreamscape turn, which means all we're going to do is we're just going to go ahead and advance to our next turn card. I'm not going to show it. I'm just going to flip the next card over there because our entity cannot move at us. We're just going to go ahead and draw our next four cards. One, two, three, four. I'm pretty excited to keep moving along. So I don't really care about when we turn that turn card. I just want to see what we get. We found our world shaper. We found Shining, we have found Optimization, and we've also found Thoughtful Moment. All right, let's go ahead and continue our game. We are going to use Shining to go ahead and grab the Cunning to allow us to move over here. And then with our next card, I'm going to go ahead and use this to grab our two awareness to go ahead and let's check this lift. Now, remember, we have to go ahead this time and add an extra 10. So we'll be going to script number S2. 24. The elevator starts. It screeches awfully, shoots sparks around, wobbles as if it could fall at any time, but miraculously, it still climbs up. We observe the lights of the passing floors, and finally, a sunray shines through the slit in the door. 
It's the forest again. Trees sway with the wind, struggling to escape the swamp they are in. It is cold. The night has already fallen for good. The birds stop singing. Somewhere far away, in the hills behind the forest, we can see some lights and a glow. Maybe it's a city. We can smell the smoke, probably from the chimneys. Don't you have a feeling someone leads you on a string? Someone or something? Reveal tile W. Relocate all dreamers to the spawning space for dreamers on the A1 tile. It seems that it's the farthest part of the dark rift. What may you find inside? You hope the creature doesn't wait for you there. It would be pretty bad, don't you think? Reveal card B. It's an overlay card. To place it correctly, read this, S16. The first thing we're gonna do is reveal tile W, and let's see what it is. It is A1. Oh, it looks like we're gonna be replacing A1 with this tile, and it's got some words up here. Oh, I can't read them, all right. Oh, it's not gonna replace A2. It's gonna just slide in right here. Wow, that's kind of cool. Now I have to go ahead and relocate my character to that spot as well. So we're gonna go ahead and move her. I think we're gonna move her right over here. I can put her on either one of those squares. I don't like standing in a pit, so we're gonna go ahead and move over there. Also, we have to look at card B. Card B is an overlay tile, and this one looks like it's gonna cover up B3. All right, let's go ahead. It says I'm supposed to read S16 to lay it down. You're looking at an overlay card. It acts as a missing additional or changed piece of the dreamscape. You have to place this card on the dreamscape immediately. How? Look closely and match it with the grid and the code. It's written on the overlay card of the dreamscape, example A1, B2, etc. Remember to match it precisely, even if this means placing it askew at a strange angle. Place all miniatures and tokens, which would be otherwise covered by the overlay card, on top of it. Done, right? Does it fit? The card may look strange at first, but it really has to be placed at this angle. What has changed? The door isn't open or closed anymore. It is destroyed. If there was a block token on it, discard it. One of the actions disappeared, and there's a new one. There is also a fragment of a blocked space, the one marked with a red frame. No one and nothing can enter this space. And through the passage on the game box cover, light pours. So if we take our card, we're gonna go ahead and overlay it on top of B, which means I'm probably gonna be discarding both of these. Let's see how this goes. B3, I'm gonna line it up just like this. I believe that's how it's going to go. The door is destroyed. This thing matches up like that. Oh my gosh, that's pretty awesome how it does that. All right, so this all fits together almost perfectly. Well, it has to fit together perfectly. They wouldn't have done it any other way. That's pretty amazing. Oh, this game's awesome. All right, oh, there we go, just like that. Perfect, wow, that's awesome. Okay, so we still get to keep the one out here on top of that, but like they said, the door is destroyed. Now it does say if all dreamers are in range one, you may use three awareness, enter the secret door, S133. Moving back over to our turn, I am gonna use my thoughtful moment. I'm gonna use it to go ahead and grab a cunning so that we can move. And we're gonna move diagonal because of our progress card. I didn't think about this, but I thought, I figured, why don't we go ahead and give this a shot? I should have started my guy up there and just moved over here, but instead I'm gonna move diagonal, we have to roll our die to see if we get that X. Oh, we got the X. So that's no big deal. We're just gonna go ahead and have to flip this card over. It says flip this card. So I can't actually use it anymore to move diagonal, which is sad, and that's my own fault because I shouldn't have actually done that. Now what we're gonna do is we are actually gonna use our world shaper card, which is gonna give us two, which means we need four more. We need to have six in order to do this. So I'm gonna discard my little helpers to give me four awareness. That's gonna give us the six we need in order to go ahead and look into the dark rift. Is that a good idea? Eh, we'll find out. We stare into the rift filled with the swirling shadows. That's our lost memories, flashbacks from the past hours, or maybe days and years. These are messy scraps of our whole life, after which there is only some fleeting memory. Something, something 
bad happened to the world. We remember a laboratory and it's hard to break through that wall of forgetfulness. If the trap card is revealed, oh, discard it back to the secrets of this dream. Oh, barf. Hmm, remember that awesome trap card that was keeping this guy at bay? Yep, no more. I'm going to go ahead and discard that trap card. And look, now he can come and get us again. That's terrible. He's going to go and eat us now. I'm going to go ahead, discard our card. Mental note, it is not good to just check everything out. Some things are going to end up doing bad things to you. Since we are moving into the dreamscape phase, we're going to go ahead and look at our turn card a little bit more closely. So the first thing our entity is going to do is it's going to morph, which has no effect. The next thing is its basic effect. Each dreamer in range one suffers one damage. That's not going to happen. There's nobody within range one. So it's then going to roll to see where it goes. Hopefully it doesn't get the super move again. That's ridiculous. Oh my gosh, you get the super move again. <laughs> it gets to move four squares. And after it does that, we're just going to go ahead and turn to our next card. It's going to do basic effect, special effect. We are down to three cards. We've got to try to find the end. Or we're going to lose from turns. That would be ridiculous. Wow, that'd be an awesome way to start the intro failing. Good news, bad news. Good news, he didn't do anything to us. Bad news, he moves one, two, three to go ahead and hang out with us. That was terrible. I should not have looked into the... Why would I want to look in the abyss? The abyss is usually bad. So the only thing left to do is we've got to get over here. One, two, three, four, because I lost my diagonal card. So we need to get at least four cunning and then three awareness. We're going to draw two cards and we're going to draw two more. Oh, good. We got hurry, hurry. That's half the battle. We've got two of the cards we need. Now I have to go ahead and shuffle this up, get this nice truffle shuffle here. And because we are shuffling our cards, I either have to seal three of these after I do this or take one damage. Now, remember, we can only, if we place an eighth damage, we lose the game, but we only have two. So I think we're going to be okay. I'm going to go ahead and place a third one. We're going to draw two more cards. We have gotten a world shaper. And our last one is, oh, we've gotten so many possibilities, which means we are so close. All right, we're going to go ahead and move into our turn. Super silly me. Remember when I said, hey, we don't need that item that gives us two more cunning. We'll be fine. We don't have to worry about moving. Nope. Well, we failed by one. So I've got one, two, three cunning right here. We're going to move one, two, three. And again, if I would have played a little bit smarter and started my character here and not used my diagonal card, I would have been able to go ahead and use diagonal right here. Now, there might be uh, a way to maybe unflip that card with some of our other cards. We can know our other two cards do not help us flip cards. That's too bad. Otherwise, it'd be awesome. And these two do not as well. So we've done our three. We're going to go ahead and see what our evil contraption is here. What is he going to do? This entity is going to basic action, special effect, and then roll the die. So special effect is two squares, one, two. Now, again, we don't count diagonal when it comes to counting to see if we're within that active area. One, two, we are not and only one for his other action. So all we're gonna do is roll the die. Why don't we go ahead and just move him four spaces? Why well, don't see why not? <laughs> Here he comes. One, two, three to right there. Oh my gosh, this is coming down to the end. Now I'm gonna go ahead and discard our card and go ahead and place our, have our next turn card available, which is gonna be morphing, rolling, and basic. So he's gonna do one damage to us if we don't actually get out of here and deal with this square right here. I'm going to discard the two cards we used last time and pick four more because I only have two, so my hand limit is six. But of course, with our devotion card, our hand limit is increased by two, so our hand limit is actually eight. I haven't actually taken advantage of that. Now looking forward, now that I know that that guy's free, maybe I should have gone with this one, but that's okay. Oh, look at that. We got it. Two, three. Oh, well, we got Cunning City now. <laughs> We got so much cunning, it's ridiculous. But we need our awareness. We need cunning. I think we're going to be good. We're going to be able to go ahead and activate that next thing and continue the game forward. We're going to see where it sends us, hopefully away from the entity. Now, I don't have enough wrath, or I could even send him to a spawn space I want, but the spawn space is one square away, which isn't going to help. All right, let's go move our guy around. Our free spirit is going to start by playing Shining and grab the one cunning to move over here. Then we're going to use three of these. We're going to go ahead and use our three awareness from these two cards here, leaving us with four, five cunning. So if I need to run anywhere else after this happens, I should be able to get there and get hopefully far enough away from that guy so he can't actually damage us next turn. Let's check out S133. But before we do, I just want to make sure this doesn't say, okay, it says if all dreamers are in range one, you may. I just want to make sure it didn't have to do with entities being next to me or I wouldn't be able to do that action. 
we enter the door on the box and a bright light engulfs us and then the woods the creature the underground chamber the game everything disappears we leave it somewhere far behind we're in a rift filled with nothing but light we crawl out we are no longer in the forest it dissolves into the past like a dream after awakening we're in a city now but can we wake up inside a dream if we're awake we shouldn't be dreaming but our surroundings the city is unlike any we know. Houses scrape a sky full of bulky airships. The moon is too large or too close, and a huge mechanical construction connects it to the ground. Neon lamps buzz and sparkle, inviting us to step inside colorful shops. Suddenly, someone approaches, a mix of a human and a rat. Ah, never mind. For a brief moment, I thought you didn't have a face. You have one, right? Such a silly idea. Sorry, the creature says and shakes a bottle in its hand. Have a wonderful night, person with a face. Victory! Each dreamer cures two damage and unseals two cards. So we're still stuck with some damage and we still have a sealed card, but that's okay. We stand in this gigantic, mysterious city, dumbfounded. And then... A memory forms at the edge of our minds. Find all cards 241L. These are the first memories you will retrieve if you meet the conditions stated on these cards. Each dreamer gains their corresponding first memory card, which relates to them. Leftover first memory cards related to dreamers who are not actually in play are placed in the storage. If the related dreamer joins the game later, they gain their first memory card from the storage. Now it's time to change the game slightly. As expected in the epilogue, don't forget to resolve all the following steps. There are many of them because in addition to rewarding you, they will add many basic elements to the game. Find the four tiles to 36A, shuffle them and make a slumber map deck from them. Two of them have starting written on them. These are the two setup slumber map tiles. They are always placed first on the slumber map. Find tiles 2, 37A, B, C, D. Shuffle them and make a slumber deck from them. One of them, 237A, is a little different. It has a green back. Place it at the bottom of the deck. We're going to start there. The first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and heal myself two damage, and I get to unseal two cards. I'm just going to put them back in my deck. I don't know if that's exactly where they go or if they go in the discard pile. We're going to put them there for now. Um, I'm sure there's, I, the rule tells me. I don't remember it right off the top of my head. We're just going to do just like that. And we're probably going to be all set to go. I'm going to discard these. I don't know if I'm going to, if they actually get to keep your hand. Again, we'll find out maybe as we continue. But I did want to heal us and go ahead and get rid of our unsealed cards. Next, we're going to go ahead and take our 241L cards. And we're going to first memory resolve this note card when you meet the conditions. Now we meet the conditions. Okay, so there's one for each person. I'll just find mine. There we go. We found the free spirit. It says... If you resolved the second step of the mysterious path, resolve S547. I have no idea what that means. I'm going to go ahead and put that right there. Next, we're going to take our four 236A cards, and two of them do stay starting down here. So I believe I'm going to put those aside, shuffle these two up, put them down, and then here's two that go right on top. I could be wrong about that, but it does say that these are starting ones, so I'm going to guess they're going to start like that. Next, I'm going to go ahead and take my 237 A, B, C, and D cards. It told us to put that one on the bottom and then to shuffle these up a little bit and place them down on the ground there. All right, place them right like that to create our slumber deck. Where to start our search? Fragments of training break through the barrier of oblivion. We knew that we would be in this situation. We have to choose which path to take. We have two options. Start an investigation to find someone who can know what's going on. Rather, look inside yourself and maybe there you will find the answers. So we can go to the city or meditate surrounded by nature. Gain Dreamgate tiles 239B, not alone in the dark, and 239 oh, I'll never forget those sunshiny days. 
These tiles allow you to enter unique dreams. If you travel to their locations in the Dream World map tiles and spend the required number of keys, you have a special envelope for keeping Dream Gate tiles. Speaking of it, you'll need several more things to travel through the Dream World map. Gain card D. You can see this is a shorter code without numbers. It means that you can find this card in the secret cards of the dream you're currently playing. The card D is a dream world map wisdom card, right? Place it in the wisdom cards holder. You'll use it to travel through the dream world map. Don't forget to recall some of these simple rules from the rule book. Gain tiles S and T. These are your first two dream world map tiles, Suburbia and Metropolis. You have to place them on the corresponding spots on the dream world map board. They represent the first two parts of the dream world. Each dreamer gains three ether. Make good use of it later. It won't be so easy to gain and to spend it, you'll need this. Gain the three cards 241C. These are note cards, so you should keep them in the storage. These particular three cards allow you to make purchases if you're in a suitable location on the Dream World map. If you don't remember how to buy influence cards, consult the rules in the rule book. A little more to go. Continuing on, it tells us to grab B and O, oh, not alone in the dark, and I'll never forget those sunshiny days. Then I believe it's talking about this. We're going to go ahead and put these right in here, and we can go to them when we get a chance. We're going to go ahead and place them in there. It doesn't actually go all the way down. Huh, that's kind of weird. All right, so we're just going to sit in the envelope like that. That's weird. Why wouldn't they actually fit in there? Oh, they do. Okay. You just have to push down a bit. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. So we're going to push them all the way down in there. There you go. All right. So these are all set to go now. I need two keys, it says, in order to go to this to one of these two tiles. So we're going to place this to the side. Next, it tells us to take card D, which is right here. It's a wisdom card. It states Dream World Map Location Effects. So this is how we're going to actually travel around the Dream World Map. We're going to place this next to the World Map when we go to actually play the campaign. Now, it does tell us to put it in the place for all the other wisdom cards, and that's this right here. You can go ahead and put them in to these different sleeved areas on this thing right here. So I could put D like right here if I have it in the right direction. Yes, I think I do. Well, anyway, you put them in there and then you have it ready to go. But we're not going to do that. We're actually going to keep this card out because I'm probably going to need to reference it as we play through the campaign. The next thing it tells us to do is to go ahead and grab S and T. That's these two right here. And this is good. Oh, wow. Look at this. This is suburbia. This is going to be our, wow, this is really cool. I bet these connect. Oh, A2 and B2. So we're going to go ahead and place those out on the board. We're going to place them right up here, A2 and B2. Oh, they do match together. Look at that. That looks really cool. The next thing to do is to grab your 241C cards. These are store note cards for shopping. You may use this card if you are in a shopping location on the Dream World map. Okay, so our Dream World map does have shopping locations. Look right down here. If we actually go in there, we can shop. That's pretty cool. Let's see what these things do. Looks like they're all exactly the same, I bet. Yep, okay. So let's just read one. It says, you may use this card if you're in the shopping location in the Dream World map. Shopping, each dreamer may buy influence cards if you choose this, but you decide to not buy any cards, gain one shining gem or draw one random from the item market and you may gain this item for two ether if you choose this but you decide to not buy that item you can gain a shining gem while well, they just shower you with shining gems after that return this shopping card to the secrets okay so we do have three shopping cards it looks like okay so we have to choose probably how to use these because we might not really keep them all forever so i'm going to go ahead and place them right over there now, of course, we also gain our three ether. I'm going to go ahead and put this on the ether side of the board. I'm going to put that up there, and it's going to go right over there. Next, find the six 241i cards and make a season's deck from them without changing their order. Place it in the season's slot. You can find it near the Dream World map board. Seasons will change during the campaign, but for now, find the Ordinary Days cards and place it face up on the top of the season's deck. Then find two, card 241M 
it's an awakening wisdom card. Place it in the wisdom cards holder. Finally, discard the current dreamscape. Remove from the game all cards and tiles of this dream, except for those already gained by dreamers or added to the game decks as well as the dream gate tile for this dream. And now to begin the campaign, resolve the awakening, you'll find the rules on the awakening wisdom card. The first thing I want to mention is I did put these in the wrong space. Looking at the way they made this map, they may should have gone with ABC up there and then DEF down here or something. So that way you don't get them screwed up. There's another A2 up at the top. But if you notice, this has a square A2. So it matches up with the A2 square on the bottom part of the board. So this is actually supposed to be on the bottom part of the board. That's my fault. Now, of course, we're also going to go ahead and take our seasons deck and I haven't shuffled it up. We're going to place it right here and we're going to go ahead and start with the first one, which is Ordinary Days. Hint. You will activate this card when you win any dream in Metropolis or Suburbia. Ordinary days. Dream world exists and you can't deny it. The rules may be strange, but at least they are consistent in their volatility. This season doesn't alter any game rules. This card is active until you activate another season card. So we're going to go ahead and have it sit just like that. And that's it. We have completed the intro scenario for Ether Fields by Awaken Realms. This is pretty cool. I'm excited as how well they taught me how to play the game. I'll be interesting to see how this all transpires as we move around on the world map when we actually do our campaign. Now that's going to be it here on the One Stop Co-op Shop. If you're interested in seeing more of Ether Fields and you want to see a little bit of the campaign and you don't mind it being spoiled, please go check it out at my channel, Meet Me at the Table. I'm going to put a link to it in the description below. You can always find a lot of more other videos continuing some of the playthroughs that I've done on One Stop Co-op Shop over there on my channel. I hope you enjoyed the playthrough. I really enjoyed it. I'm excited to see where this game leads. Now it is confirmed that Jason Perez is actually going to continue the playthrough of Ether Fields on the One Stop Co-op Shop. He's going to use the specialist. I'm really excited to check it out. So stay tuned for more Ether Fields here on One Stop Co-op Shop. Thanks to Jason Perez. Thank you so much for watching. And if you're excited to see what comes next, then I need you to meet me at the co-op shop.